Warning, this podcast contains heavy spoilers for not just one movie, but entire franchises. We highly recommend going and watching these movies before listening to us as a companion piece that stitches all the timelines into one creepy, crime-ridden story. There will be no more spoiler warnings. We do not break character. After this, there is no turning back. You've been warned. Hit the music. <laughs> you are talking about the nonsensical ravings of a lunatic mind. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! A man walks into a bar with an ostrich and a cat and sits at the bar. The bartender walks over to them and says, what can I get for you? The man says, I'll have a beer. The ostrich says, I'll have a beer. The cat says, I'll have a beer and I'm not buying. So the bartender says, okay, that'll be $3.87. The man reaches into his pocket and brings out the exact change and pays him. About an hour later, the bartender goes back over to them and says, what do you guys have? The man says, I'll have a beer. The ostrich says, I'll have a beer. The cat says, I'll have a, I'll have a half a beer. And I'm not buying. The bartender gets them the beer and says, that'll be 387. The man reaches into his pocket and brings out the exact change and pays him. A couple of days later, they come back into the bar and the bartender walks over and asks, what you guys want today? The man says, I'll have a scotch. The ostrich says, I'll have a bourbon. The cat says, I'll have half a beer and I'm not buying. So the bartender says, okay, that'll be $7.53. The man reaches into his pocket and brings out the exact change and pays him. The bartender, bartender's curiosity got the best of him and he asks, why is it that every time I tell you the amount you owe, you always have the exact change in your pocket? The man said... I found a bottle with a genie in it, and she granted me three wishes. My first wish was that I always had the exact change in my pocket for anything I buy. The bartender says, that's a great wish. Better than asking for a million dollars. A million dollars will run out, but you will never run out if, you know, you always have the exact Mm. amount of money in your pocket. What were your other two wishes? The man says, well, that's where I screwed up. I asked for a chick with long legs and a tight pussy. (laughs) (laughs) Hello and welcome to It's a Live Alive podcast. This is a true crime paranormal interstellar podcast covering unbelievable stories that sound like they were ripped straight from the pages of a Hollywood script. I'm your host, a man of many names, the outlaw Harley Ray, the bruiser Bronson, Dr. H.R. Smokenstein, THC, or you can call me Josh for short. And with me, as always, is my very own Scream Queen, the perfect combination of beauty and brains, the bride of Smokenstein, the India Hard X, with the guts and gore, the gorgeous, the sexy Amy Rose. Oh, I'm trying not to get sick. <laughs> I've been sick all fucking week. In fairness, yeah, you have. Oh, God, Monday bad. Morning. oh my God, the kids didn't know what to fucking make of it. <laughs> I, I like woke up. I, you caught me Monday morning to walk him uh, to school. Uh, and I knew the minute, I knew before, and we were recording the mini souls, I think, the night before. Yeah. I yeah. think we do them on Sundays, don't we? Yeah. And, and I, I knew going to bed, it was like, I feel a bit fucking funny. And I woke as soon as I woke up, I was like, I'm fucked. I am I could absolutely tell by you, yeah, fucked. you weren't enjoying it at all. And I was like, I'm going to puke. And I was like, do you know what it was like? Because all I had to do was get dressed, walk down the stairs, and the boys were waiting for me at the door to walk mm. into school. And the school is literally like Too at nice. the top of our estate. Yeah. So it's like you walk around the corner of our estate and there's the school. And I remember getting out of that bed, getting into my clothes and thinking, do you know what it felt like was, do you know when you're really, really drunk and you're <laughs> starting to get the spinners, but you just need to get you to your bed? Yeah. Yeah. That's what it was like. I needed to get him to school and back to bed as quick as I could before I puked. So why didn't you let me take him when I offered? Because you you would work, you would stuff to do. You were, I mean, Amy works from home. So, I mean, you, you were like getting ready to go on the phone lines. I just, it was going to take me two minutes. I'd be okay. home again in two minutes, you know. I got as far as the corner and just started vomiting everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> and the two boys were just like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fairness to Riley, though, he, he manned up and he was like, Dad, you go home. I'll take you in from here. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no, so we could cute. see the fucking school at yeah. this point. And I had only planned on taking them another, like, fucking yard or two before I turned around and went home anyway. 
But uh, I got there. Fionn was very concerned coming out of school. Oh, man, that was a shitty day. The first day of it was bad. Mm-hmm. It was just like cramp, nausea, a bit of ease, back to cramp, Aww. nausea, a bit of ease. And then since then, it's just been a lighter version of that for the last few days. I, it's not like I can't do stuff. I've been doing stuff. I've been down yeah. here fucking working on oh, this yeah. and stuff. But uh, None of the rest of us have gotten that. No. I think it was food poisoning. I don't know. Maybe I tried to kill you. Maybe you did. <gasps> An investigation will be opened. By me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I oh know. I reckon Fiona, he'd be impartial. <laughs> if, he, if he thought you did the crime, he'd write you up. He'd tell me it would be our secret, but then he would wrap me out. <laughs> <laughs> but for that reason, this week, we're going to go a little bit more chilled out than our usual heavy, heavy tone. But I think mm-hmm. we need to do that from now on. I think it needs to be two or three weeks of me fucking hitting heavy, heavy stories. And then... You don't have to be heavy, heavy. No, but I don't mean heavy, heavy. I mean story heavy, script heavy. Okay. Big stories. And then I need a week where we just... When we talk stories that are a little easier to digest. So, like, three weeks of hard-hitting journalism and then, like, your feel-good story. Yeah, because okay. my brain was fucking wiped after that. After the the, the, ex- uh, the uh, exorcism stuff. <laughs> it was a lot of it, in fairness. It, it was a lot. It felt like... Though that too... Oh, no, but I said that. Because we had been working on it since Christmas, because there hadn't been an episode since Christmas... Mm. It felt like what usually I do in a week lasted forever. It, yeah, it was like ghost faced all over again for me because that that lasted for months before we launched. I'm looking forward to what's coming though. What's fucked up is I I've gotten into all that ghost face stuff again since like at least two more times. <laughs> do you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've watched the stab movies with my son since then. Do you know? Mm. All over again. Yeah. I can't get enough. <laughs> But this week, we have been dealing with crazy animals across the mm-hmm. board, which is why I went with an ostrich and cat joke to start with. So I like to hear about ostrich attacks. Ostriches freak me out. They don't freak me out. They freak me out. They, they look angry. But do you know why they freak me out? Mm. I think it's because a dude wears my car with the crazy ostriches that attack him. And then the talk kind of got into my head of, well, if an ostrich did decide to fucking attack me with that aggression, what would I do? And they were there in the whole pile you can do. They're, they're, they're a big animal. I mean, have you ever seen them? Have you ever seen an ostrich? There was ostrich farms yeah, all over an this country for a while. I don't know. How. In cool woods? Or are they emus? Oh, yeah. No, no, they're no, ostriches. They were more emus. Were they emus? Uh, I just think you might have a fear of things with long necks. Yeah, I don't like giraffes. I don't That's like... Yeah, I like giraffes. I like to look at giraffes. But when I saw that video of the giraffes <laughs> chasing down the cat... Have you ever seen that yeah, video? Yeah, I showed you. Yeah, the, the, those people and they're like driving and the, the giraffe is literally like tearing trees down, <laughs> fucking chasing down after them. And that's when I realized giraffes were something to be feared. Before that, I had no problem with giraffes. But as soon as I saw that video, I was like, oh shit, yeah, we need to stay fucking well clear of them. That looks like a once in a... Blue moon kind of thing. Elephants don't bother me, though. I like elephants. Elephants come back for revenge, Josh, after they've killed you. So, I mean... We talked about that on um, Real Monsters this week. Real Monsters. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Real Real Monsters. Monsters. We thought we were talking about uh, criminal animals. Criminal animals, yeah. um, Where was I going with that? Yeah, I don't like drafts. No, because of that video. I'd I'd, I'd go to the zoo and look at a draft. I wouldn't go running from it or anything like that. (laughs) Would you but go I into the reptile like, house, spider house? I, I mean, like, I know I, I don't like big spiders, yeah. but when they had tarantulas over in the pet store, they were all behind You're glass fine, cases. Man. I went over and I had a look, no problem. See, when we first met, I thought that I genuinely got the feeling from you that you wouldn't even be that close. Like, it would, we glass between I told you there was that fear. Like, there yeah. was a king, like, I hated it. If I saw a big, like, one of those hunter ones coming into the house, I free, used to freak <laughs> yeah, the fuck right. out. You know, which was funny because at the time I was also president of a fucking motorcycle club, so I was supposed to be the big tough guy. And it, there I was, like, we're running out of the room at the side of a spider. But it was just the kind of thing of there was that stage, which, you know, when you're in the early days of being an adult and you're broke all the fucking time. And I was taking jobs, any job I could get, and I was working with that guy clearing all fucking houses and sheds yeah. and stuff like that, dead people's houses. We've discussed yeah. it before when we were talking about the possibility of bringing ghosts into the house. Mm. But there was um, just a case of one day, I can't remember what it was, but we had some bill we had to fucking pay. And it was like, we, we had to get it paid. No, 
I don't know, was it something to do with the car or something? Mm. But, you know, but again, this is like an early on, you know, R- Riley was or ba- a baby, like, you know? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I remember we went to this place and we had to clear out this shed. And this shed was overgrown and fucking old. It was just full of old stuff and mm-hmm. it was just covered in spiders. And I remember standing outside there looking in there and thinking to myself, I kind of just have to suck it up if I, if I want to get this bill paid. I got to oh, suck yeah. it up and just get on with it. And ever since then, they just haven't bothered me anymore. It's well, I remember not an you issue. came home that evening and you were sitting on Riley's bed and you were all in black and the three of us sitting there and you were reading Riley's story and you were all in black. And next thing I could see this black thing running. It was that big running across your arm. That was all in black. Like it was yeah. that fucking big and you they took it off. It was huge. You brought them home with you like... But that was it. After that, it was just like, fuck. Because at the same time, if one came crawling up on me now, I'd jump up and I'd swat it off me and, and, and all that shit. But you've seen I've gotten even gentler when it comes to spiders. I, I used to be of the oh, mentality yeah, before. Yeah. I would just squash it the minute you see it. Mm-hmm. And now I see a spider and it's like, how can we get it out the door? Yeah. I'm getting soft in my old age. Yeah. <laughs> I, th- I think when we brought in the outside stuff, though, we had no choice but to accept that there would be spiders in this house. What do you mean the outside stuff? We brought in, there was a trike outside. Remember we brought it into the oh, bedroom? Oh, fuck me, yeah. That this was one bad. time that was the, bad. One of the boys left their, their tricycle outside the back garden overnight during the summer. And the next day we bought it inside and we put it in the playroom. And one of us were passing. I think you were passing. You were passing. <laughs> you caught it. me. I do double take, yeah. And it was like twilight kind of sort of. Someone was going down and, and, and there was just the light. Was Golden hour yeah, kind of yeah. listening into the playroom and you could just see the car, oh, the treads. web everywhere. Mm-hmm. Just running all over the fucking it room. It was kind of web. pretty, like, but it, it was, was also pretty, disturbing. It was also like, oh shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> get the, the fuck back outside. Get the hoover, get the fucking trike out of here, get the <laughs> just hoover the and just house. start fucking <laughs> cleaning. Fuck me. <laughs> so there are fucking animal horror stories. There are insect horror stories. We don't have any insect oh, horror stories. Oh, then I didn't learn my lesson that time and I brought in another outside bike, the the, the little fire engine one. And next yeah. thing I put it down in the middle of, of the kitchen to like clean it off. And there was just earwigs fucking everywhere. Ugh. Everywhere falling out <laughs> of it. And we got... um. We got a little mouse friend around here. We talked about him like in the last week or two. We can't catch this little prick. Mm-mm. We've got traps thrown everywhere. We've got the humane traps. We've got the inhumane traps. Because if he's going to be cheeky, we got to put him down. But he is cheeky. More than once, I've seen him nearly do a backflip and skid in the ground when he realizes yeah, that we've, we've seen him. Like, him like, yeah. peek out at us to see if we're looking. And if and he catches take us a looking, and, yeah. he, he, he'll go away. And if he, he thinks we're not looking, then he'll make a run for it. And we'll catch him going under the fucking door. But I, can't ca- I just can't catch him. There's nothing I can do to catch him. Remember last week we thought we had him in the bin. We heard him in the bin. Yeah. We closed the top of the bin. We got the bin outside <laughs> and then we realized he had put a hole in the bottom of our bin. And the bin was gone. Yeah, he was and gone. He was gone. Yeah, just just gone. At the time you released the chocolate finger just into the wild. Mouse hunt. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're Lee Evans and that other dude. And it was mouse just, trap. It's ridiculous. Mouse hunt. Oh, mouse, mouse trap, trap is game. game. Huh? That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, but speaking of it, before we get into like animal attack stuff. Have you had any negative experiences with animals? A guinea pig bit me once. Yeah? <laughs> Your dad got bit by a ferret. <gasps> my dad got bit by a ferret. Oh, my God. It was... No, I'm sorry, Dad. It was really awful. Like, it was. But I, he, you see, my dad's already... He, he, he's a messer. Like, he is a big joker. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes you don't know whether he's being serious or not. And he had ferrets when he was younger. And I came home one day from college for the weekend. And he's sitting there with two white ferrets. And he's like, do you, want, do you want to sit down and hold him? And I was like, yeah, no bother. And I had one in my hand and he's sitting across from me. And the ferret's up in his shoulder. And next thing, he starts like grabbing his earlobe and he's going red. And he's like, ah, ah, the ferret's biting me. And the ferret's snout was in my dad's fist as well. And I was like, oh, he's taking the piss. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah. And dad's getting like redder and redder. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. So I had to go over. And obviously, like they don't, they don't open their jaws once they bite. Yeah, so I had him. no choice but to grab this ferret and rip it from my dad's oh. ear like I can still I can still remember the noise of it and oh there's blood everywhere and once they're bloodthirsty they're bloodthirsty oh well, they're, once they're bloodthirsty yeah, like yeah, yeah once they get to the taste for it at all so that they lasted about a week <laughs> <laughs> and then they found a nicer no not a, a better not a nicer home a better home in the sky <laughs> no, Josh. I actually think they were given to a guy that uh, Joe just ferret and services. So, yeah. But to be fair to you, 
you don't know your dad. I, there's a lot of times where I just have to like give, like after dad says something, I have to stare at his expression for a good five to ten seconds. <laughs> he's very good at holding it though, my, yeah. To make up my mind whether he's taking the piss <laughs> or whether he's being serious. <laughs> he's very good to keep his straight face though, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think I kind of clicked when he was nearly purple. Huh? I kind of clicked when he was nearly purple, like that he wasn't messing no, I know dad would be very gentle but when it comes to animals, especially. Oh fucking, my god, my dad, dad loves fucking, animals. Yeah, 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 I think he, he gets on better with animals than he does with people half the time. Him yeah. and that fucking cat are like stuck to the hip. Best boys. <laughs> yeah. But I can't think of anything. I mean, we were. I was more the fucking terror to the animals than the other way around when I was a child, especially Psycho. cows. All cows got it hard where we lived. See, the thing was, like, we lived, we live in a town, so it was weird. But do you, know, do you know where the hospital is? The the the, the private hospital. Do you go cow tipping? No, you uh, can't, that, I don't think it's a real thing. And neither do I. No, we used to chase this shit out of them. But um, it, it, basically, there was, like, this big wall in our estate. And went over the wall. Like, the, it's, like, between all yeah, these know, fucking uh, regular urban housing estates, there's mm. this one fucking field. And in that field, greyhounds were kept uh, in little runs. Okay. And then there was cows, a bunch of cows kept. Don't know where the farm was. No idea where the farm was. No idea where the, cow, the cows went and came. They were just there. It would just Sometimes we'd look over the wall, the cows would be there. Sometimes they wouldn't. The field would be empty. That's crazy. So I don't know. <laughs> but when they were there, we would play them. Every time they got anywhere near to our wall, we'd go over. But then it would be like, you know, the panic of trying to get... Especially when we were smaller. Yeah. The wall was a bigger wall, so you'd have to run and run up the wall to, get, to try and grab on and get over. Mm. And if there was a bull in there, it was always like we the, the boys obviously start fucking pushing each other to like, go on a dairy to go in, and you'd everyone would be going in and trying to get up before the bull would fucking come over and all that. And no, I don't think the bull ever once made any attempt to come near any of us. But you know the way kids are. Yeah. 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 He's coming! He's coming! He's nah, coming! Jump! 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 jump. <laughs> but, uh, up, like. Yeah, we drove those cows fucking demented. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> they, they were getting sour milk from that place, definitely. <laughs> Uh, I don't think I've ever been attacked by any animal. Never attacked. Not that I can think of. Had a few dogs run at me back in, but they never actually do anything. We had a dog once that went uh, missing, and uh, we found him in the backfield. But like my best friend, she lived like two doors down. Well, now two doors down in the country, like that kind of distance. So, and she had like two dogs that knew me, but they didn't like my dog because he was new. But like they were attacking him while I was lying like on him to stop him from them from attacking him. I suppose oh. I was about maybe like. 12 or 30 yeah dad brought me to the pub afterwards and he was like well you'll never guess what happened tonight but it was we were all out looking for him and my one of the lads used to work for dad kind of spotted me and he went like and the dogs down. left you alone the dogs all blacky and what was the other guys I can't I can't remember two big laboratories they left me alone but their teeth were bared and they were going right in under me to get at Oscar but Jesus. they didn't touch me because they knew me I suppose that's mental mm, not once they touched me actually yeah. and then we were best friends again afterwards everybody yeah yeah Everyone was getting on, no problem. Everybody got on, no problem. <laughs> but I find that crazy. like Because uh, Riley finds it amazing how uh, Sammy around here will do anything I tell her to do. do you know, uh, and, and even when any of you kind of roar uh, something at her, she'll kind of give me a look first to see oh, if yeah. she gets the nod to go do as she's been told by somebody else. Unless I'm not in the house. Yeah. And it's crazy just how animals do, got, do oh, have yeah. that fucking bright into them that there's like someone in the house they look at and it, for her it's you and me mm -hmm. you know she look at one of the two of us if the kids say something to see and when we're not around like I, I, Riley has said she will do as I've heard her fucking I've heard Riley roar fucking commands at her oh yeah we're not when just roar now it has to no, be her you know, like, go yeah, to bed Sammy yeah and uh, she'll just take off out. Mm -hmm. she, you know but it, it's just, or like in the mornings when we're getting ready for school he'll come down but he'll like open the back door for her and, and you know she listens to him now but it's just amazing how smart they are how they just seem to fucking oh, yeah. figure out how it all works mm -hmm. and, and you know just follow I hate saying commands but it no, is no but I, I think like, it's intuition as well because sometimes I just have to look at Sammy and it's nearly like a slight move of the like 
come here like do, do oh, that yeah, kind yeah. of way and she knows and she's over beside you like well, it's not a call, and that dog at this a... point have just looks yeah things. she knows like if i look at her this way it's okay to do that if i look at her that way you know, yeah. and, like last so last week when she came in here and pissed all over the rug and after oh, that she knew that uh boy. she wouldn't even look at me for <laughs> about two days <laughs> she just every time she kind of i glanced over at her she'd look away as fast as you she could, could nearly even hear her internal monologue going i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well uh we talk about that because again like i said we're going to talk about real crazy animals today mm-hmm. and uh are you leading in i know you're doing two before i do a big one at the end uh, mm-hmm. but um are you leading in with the dog or the bear i lead in with the dog i suppose we were just talking about dogs so let's go with it yeah. i actually know we'll uh, progress we'll go dog bear shark yes okay cool. but uh yeah the dog kind of i'll be honest with you, this story creeps me out because Let's face it, the bear one you're going to get into next that most people know about already is a it's rare a one anomaly. It's a million, billion. <laughs> but, uh, but this this dog thing is uh, something that can oh, happen absolutely. very, very easily to anybody at any stage in time. So I find this to be almost like fucking just horror. Well, just to put it into perspective for you, mm-hmm. it's about a rabid dog. And rabies kills 59,000 people people worldwide a year like yeah mm-hmm. how does rabies affect people does rabies. it affect us the same way as dogs do we go a fucking mental and zombie oh yeah and yeah yeah now there's different not different types of rabies you you, you you pretty much aren't recovering from rabies ever no matter like how fast you catch it like once you've got it and it is actually scary because the incubation period like you could what what once it sets in not not sets in but once it's there it can take anywhere from four days to six years for shit to go south like so, so yeah, it could be brewing in you for six years and then the symptoms start to show, but so there's no way know for that's it. Time. There's no way of diagnosing rabies until you have the symptoms. Okay. And then by the time the symptoms appear, I think maybe a handful of 14 or 15 people have ever fucking been recorded as survivors. But what happens to you? Like? So you get hallucinations, you get hydrophobia. What's uh, hydrophobia? Hydrophobia is a fear of water. Okay. So you just uh, develop a fear of water. Yeah. You can get uncontro- uncontrolled excitement. Uh, violent movements, vomiting, nausea, uh, an inability to move parts of the body, confusion, loss of consciousness. But like, it's scary the the the, the fear of water because it, it's nearly like a, like a sentient virus, nearly in that way because it kind of, it spreads through the saliva glands. So if you have a fear of water, you're and you're not able to swallow things like that, you're not going to be wanting to drink. So all that is, it's building inside your mouth, like because you're not washing it away. Like that's right. Do you know what's crazy? Yeah. All the symptoms you just listed. Are what you have had this week? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> Fuck me, no. Thank God, no. <laughs> but, um, fucking uh, Regan McNeil, the exorcism. Hallucinations, in and out of things. Who are no. not coming out of rabies. Oh, I know that, but I'm just saying they the similarities. Uh, oh, but well, you know, one in a million chance, maybe. But I mean, like, I suppose if you're that far along... But what I'm saying is, like, even down to what you say, the aversion to water, mm-hmm. would be, would that not explain the holy water fucking being the thing that made her freak out? Especially when Father Karras afterwards said that it wasn't holy water or sprinkled on her at all, but regular fucking water. If the rabies is giving you an aversion to water, could that not have been the fucking thing that was like... So it, obviously it wasn't because they would have said, oh, she had rabies later. <laughs> and said she's you know, um, this amazing person who survived this level of rabies and came back from it. And that, then, then it would have been some divine fucking thing because the priests would have prayed the rabies away. <laughs> but yeah. all I'm saying is if I was a doctor and they were going through all those other things, I would have thought about maybe rabies, especially when it was the, when the water thing came up. Like, oh, yeah, she freaked out when holy water hit her. When she thought holy water hit her, oh, she freaked out when water hit her. Maybe she's got rabies. Yeah, I suppose if I was a doctor and she told me that that was shit, like... Maybe she has rabies. She thinks she's a demon. Maybe she has rabies. She's in and out of consciousness. Maybe she has rabies. Yeah. Has she been around any fucking one animals? Has she been bitten by a rat, a mouse stone, that fucking... Rabies are fucking actually the least likely to carry constantly. rabies, believe it or not. Do you know? Mm-hmm. I mean... They had that thing of uh, the windows were wide open. The, the night park Dennings died. Maybe a fucking back came in a bit bitter. I mean, because I know that plays a big part in the story you're about to tell. So, bats, yeah, dogs usually are they're they're, they're the biggest spreaders of rabies. But bats right. are only a big spreader of rabies because their bites are so small that they go undetected a lot. Like, 
Oh, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, yeah. So that's that. But, that's um, there. but that's it. Uh, to be honest, when it came to rabies, I had always heard of it as a dog kind of disease. Yeah. So I yeah. would have associated it with a disease for dogs. I wouldn't have thought of humans getting rabies. I wouldn't have thought of other yeah. animals get rabies because anytime you saw it in TV or cartoons or movies, it was a rabid dog. Oh, yeah. oh, I suppose Chris Benoit used to be the rabid wolverine, so I suppose it could happen to any of them. I think the statistic in America is that like 90% oh, of rabies me, cases in right. humans are caused by dogs. That is irony. That's ir- that is irony, right? What's irony? That Chris Benoit was called the rabid wolverine and then eventually went Maybe. absolutely batshit crazy and killed his whole family. Maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Anyway, back to rabies. <laughs> okay so the story basically centers around the trentons so they were vic donna and their son tad so vic was working in advertising and donna was just a stay-at-home housewife and tad was described as the type of sensitive boy that didn't you know he was scared of monsters in his closet all right kind of like well, i really used to kind of be like that i mean since he got into watching horror he's not so much but um when he was very, very young, he could have been. He, he used to be a bit tense. We had to start putting up the dream catchers and all this kind of shit around the place. So oh, yeah, yeah. We understand that exactly. kind of child. So the Trenton family needed to repair their car and they took it to the local uh, mechanic. And that was Joe Camber for some repairs. And there they met the star of the story, a dog named Cujo. Oh, St. I like Bernard. that name. Oh, I love the breed, St. Bernard's. Yeah, Cujo just sounds like a nice name to be honest with you. You know what that means? I don't wonder does Cujo have a meaning? Meaning of the name Cujo. Oh my god, there are baby names. (laughs) No, (laughs) no, no, no. no. What does Cujo mean in English? Okay, I don't. Seems to be a Portuguese thing. I don't know. Oh, uh, oh it means um, in dog names, it means loving, loyal, brave, and resilient with compassionship and courage. Well, that was so. a bit misnamed. Huh? Misnamed. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, I'll let you make your own mind up, I suppose. But, uh, oh, I should. Uh, point out at this stage as well because it does play in later into the story that uh, Vic and Donna their marriage wasn't great at the time Okay. and Donna was having an affair with uh, her ex-boyfriend uh, Steve and what it. was uh, what did you say her husband's name was? Vic was Vic a bit of a dick? Uh, no I don't think so I, I don't think Vic was a bit of a dick from what I've heard uh, there, there, there's been no so Donna was there. being a bit of a dick Donna was being a bit of a dick. <laughs> oh, okay. And so was Steve. Don't just claim Donna. Steve oh, knew she yeah. was. Yeah. Well, to be honest, I've always had this debate. And I, 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 who is really to blame in a cheating scenario? The person who is cheating on someone or the person who is helping the person cheat? Do they're you know? both just as guilty as each other, though, I think. Yeah. No, I admit they're both doing wrong, but I still think the person who is cheating is doing worse than the person who is helping them cheat. But if you're a good person, you won't. Oh, you're if you're a good person, to... you wouldn't do it, but you're still single in this situation and not really a fault. Yeah, yeah if you were you, if you were good morals and you were a decent person, <laughs> yeah, you'd be like, yeah, okay, I shouldn't probably do this, but, <laughs> you know, but... Uh, but then if you watch The Bridges in Madison County, I'd never say Clint Eastwood is an asshole. I've never seen that movie. Oh, you should watch it. Yeah, it sounds like my kind of movie. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It's one of those movies that Amy be like, let's watch, let's watch, let's watch. And 10 minutes in, she'll be asleep and I'll be sitting there watching some fucking romance. I do, if I want to watch Clint Eastwood, it's not in a romance. He's, okay, fine. <laughs> fine, I'll watch it myself. Watching him in Dirty Harry or fucking something. <laughs> Anyway, so where was it? Oh, yeah, they had taken their car to, to Mr. Camber. We called him Joe because I can't keep saying that name. Mr. Camber. Mr. Camber. So Mr. To Joe Camber. for some repairs. And they Mr. met Cujo Joe. there. And Donna said that she had noticed at the time that Cujo had a bite in his nose. But it was only like a tiny little mark. And very observant Donna, huh? Well, I suppose the, the dog was over. The dog was supposed to be very friendly at this stage over, very playing friendly. with them. Like, and obviously, if Tad 
So yeah, yeah. Well, when you see a dog with a bit of a mark, right? yeah, a bit of cut, yeah. Like, you do kind of notice it. Yeah. People are way more sympathetic to dogs than that. Because oh, me, yeah. uh, Riley and myself talked about it lately when he watched um, Halloween at Halloween, the first one, the nineteen yeah. seventies one. Mm. And for most of that, I think I mentioned it on one of the Patreon shows or on the Weekend Update. But he was. Um, all for the movie until fucking Michael Myers killed the dog and it was like dad why did he kill the dog and it was like well he just killed about four or five people before this and he's like oh yeah so he did but now I hate him because he killed the dog (laughs) (laughs) that's it once he killed the dog he he was the bad guy all the people beforehand they were just (laughs) yeah yeah. disposable (laughs) and a lot of people feel that way people fucking have no like we talked about Barry Keown yeah. or whatever he calls himself uh, I, I, he's second name I don't know okay, it's Keown uh, you're Irish man Keogan Keogan I don't know any Keogans in Ireland I do without a H anyway it, it, to most of the world he is like this super he, he got introduced as this massive actor on the Hollywood stage to Irish people he was introduced to us as that little scumbag fuck that shot the cat and fucking love hate that everybody hated I forgot he shot the cat as well. He was on the front page of every Irish tabloid, every granny in Ireland, every fucking active uh, animal activist in Ireland hated his character, hated him, and fucking he was slid. I think he himself even said like that he had grannies giving out him in the street. Serious, right? <laughs> uh, and it was obviously a fake fucking scene. It was, it oh, was yeah. a, it's a gangster show called Love Hate, and he was uh, supposed to be a teenager holding a gun for one of the other gangsters mm. and he was showing off to his friends so he shot the cat in the, the estate mm. and poor Barry ends up getting a bullet in his head for his troubles before the end of that season but uh, that was the start of his career for us spoiler here. what? I said spoiler not spider a spoiler I was like, what? <laughs> you should have seen him jump <laughs> I went my right the boys had this spoiler that they made for Halloween oh it's it got me the other day as well yeah. oh I've dumped it now it has caught me three times last week Mm-mm. because I, I thought it was gone for ages. It was like we put it away. So I think it got stuck behind one of the chairs in the fucking oh, kitchen. Oh, okay. And I was cleaning the shit out of the place last day. And next thing I put, I'm pulling apart like the cushions on the, the chair. <laughs> and next thing this big black spider jumps out at me. I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> because this isn't like a, a regular size. No, this is, like, this tra- is tarantula. This is fucking big Bigger tarantula, than tarantula size. Yeah. So I jumped. It's a piece of paper that's in the shape, a black piece of paper in the shape of a spider. And the thing I about just, them is if they get crumpled at all, they look like yeah. they're up on legs. And then the next day, uh, uh, two days later, I'm like hoovering around the same chair <laughs> and it fell down the back of the chair again and I jumped and I was like, you know, fuck you and I just crumpled it up. So why don't you just have to take it the hoover back? It has gone into the bin. It is gone. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Cujo and he's bite mark on his nose and um, the bite mark on his own yep so, but Donna said that she had noticed it but that she you know he was happy he was friendly he was playing with with Tad so like what of it so they left their, the car there and Donna was to go back uh, Joe after a few days to collect it and Vic was gone off on uh, he worked in advertising so he was gone off on this business trip no yeah but in the meantime while Joe had the car repair and Cujo was getting worse okay and Joe's wife and son went off to visit her sister for a few days. So they were gone out of the house. Yeah. And then the dog, um, well, like it really set in and it it killed Joe and it killed his neighbor who obviously came over to visit Joe after Joe was killed. And that was Gary Parvier. And she mauled them like. Mauled them. Mauled them. Yeah, they go crazy. Fucking ripped their throat out. Fucking absolutely batch it crazy. Oh man, that would be. Absolutely batch it. And they're here. So this is like Beethoven gone fucking wild. Yeah, yeah, exactly it. Yeah, yeah. Ooh. I prefer Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> so after. Oh, that's a movie idea. What? We could pitch that idea, right? We'll take the story of this wild dog, Cujo, yeah. and we'll, we'll have Cujo versus Beethoven. Okay. Like Freddy versus Jason. It'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> How is Beethoven winning? Huh? I don't. F- I, I feel like Beethoven because, yeah, Beethoven's not coming out of that one. Yeah. With Cujo. Let's see. <laughs> so Donna and Tad went back to collect the car from Joe. Um, but they find Joe dead mm-hmm. and they get into the car find a bit of Joe over here a bit of Joe, Joe over, over there, there a bit of Joe down there everywhere yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, they realize that uh, Cujo's got absolutely fucking nuts and they try to get into the car. Well, they, are, they do get into the car, but they try to escape. Okay. Yeah. And the alternator died. Oh, mm-hmm. I know that feeling that's happened to me before. That That's not nice. No. So they are stuck in this car with the rabbit dog, with Cujo, absolutely fucking losing its mind. And the thing about with rabies is, as well as particular, I don't know if this one happens to humans. I presume it must, though. But um, with dogs, loud noises freak them the fuck out. So they could be like, you know, through like a lull period of like, you know, just oh, being asleep. Yeah. And next thing they hear a loud noise and they're back to this like ferocious. Rabid, like, just yeah, yeah, exactly. Crazy. Exactly. Well, question for you. So this happened, what, what year did this happen in, did you say? Mm, 1977 oh even the decade is just, I'm wondering so I'm, I'm, like, there's no phone or wifi here like there was a phone in the house no but I mean there's no, no phone in their pocket so I'm no just wondering how long would it take the rabies to kill the dog how long would they have to stay in this car without food and water to to so rabies, outlive the dog rabies usually I actually have a statistic for that here uh, rabies kills anywhere from so I'm just going to sing for a while <laughs> it was I can't find her it was I, I, I think it was between like six to nine days okay yeah you can't survive that now, now where were they from LA was it LA? Texas. 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 So it's hot as Oh my fuck. God. I mean, like it was so hot in this car at the time that, uh, that Tad, he started having convulsions. Is it, is it like summertime or what? It was pretty much the height of summer. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So hot, hot. So if you don't have water that day, you're probably dead. Or you're dying of heat stroke or dehydration. Yeah. 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 yeah, okay. yeah. So every time Donna tried to escape, Cujo would hear. Or else the phone will go off inside the house, Donna said at one stage. But and Vic, driving fucking bonkers. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And Vic, in the meantime, had been trying to call as well because he wasn't getting any answer from from at home. Like, so he wanted to see if she had made it out there. To exactly see, you know, to get if the car. Like, happened in the meantime, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. If something had happened on the way uh, beforehand mm. or on the way. But back. when Cujo was here in the phone, he was freaking out. So, so there was it was pretty much a fucking vicious circle for her. So then in the end, she's kind of like, Tad is convulsing. And, you know, as a parent, like, you're like, well, well got to do it. Suck it up. Suck it up and go. And let but Cujo bit her on the leg when she did manage to get out of the car. So she forced back inside the car. Would that give her rabies? It can. It can. But the fact that she knew, knew that she would be bit by a rabbit dog, she'd be able to get treatment before the symptoms set in see that's but the thing like symptoms could set in so quick that you're fucked like i mean if, if what no if it's not there? so quick that you're fucked it's just that one symptom set in if you don't know that you've been infected by rabies one symptom set in you're fucked because it's the only way to know that you have rabies okay. but if you have been well, bit with something that has been knows, identified yeah. that has rabies which is yeah. usually why if you're bit by by something but if you're bit by a wild animal, oh, you in go general, straight, yeah, you go in America, America like, they will instantly fucking. That's it, like because you don't know what it was carrying. For rabies, yeah, yeah. because it's like we don't know if it happened. But then it can lie test dormant. You for rabies instantly, exactly. But it's not that it kills you instantly; it can lie dormant in your system for up to six years, and then say, "Oh well." Time but that's why they yeah. test you for it straight exactly. away. Way if you're bitten for an animal by an animal over there, exactly. But it can like if if you're if you're a dog in America. It's actually dangerous in America to have a fucking dog. If, if your dog sneezes on you and it has rabies and like one of those like saliva particles gets into your eye, gets into your mouth, that's easily transmi- transmissible that way as well. Like. Jesus. Mm-hmm. So in the end, she made another attempt again at getting out of the car, but Cujo heard the phone ring this time. And so she went back in and then Vic came home to Donna because he was so worried. Okay. He came back to the house. When he got back to the house, he found the house ransacked and obviously Donna and Tad not there. So he knew that Donna had been having an affair with Steve. Okay. Yeah. So he put it down to Steve. 
Oh, he reckoned Steve had done something he to Donna. He reckoned that Steve had done something to Donna and made off because with Donna, Because Steve had trashed the house. Ex- Why did he trash the house? Did she break up she with him She broke or up with him. Yeah, okay. exactly. So when Vic came home, he saw the house trashed and he knew that they, that they, that so she had Donna put had an been end to it. trying to mend her ways exactly. and fix her marriage and, and all this kind of shit. And this exactly. guy decided, fuck her, when he got to the house and there was no one there, he trashed the shit out of it. Yeah, saying. yeah, exactly. Which so, but when Vic called the cops... Fuck, when... The wife goes missing, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look good when the ex-lover, the jilted lover, trashes the house and the man, <laughs> yeah. the woman is missing. So when Vix called the cops and they went and they found Steve, and Steve admitted to trashing the house, but he didn't have any idea where Donna and Tad were. And that's when it clicked with Vic that they were obviously, they had to be over at Cambridge or Joe's house. So they sure. sent over one of the deputies and a few hours passed and there was no sign of the deputy coming back. So they reckon that the deputy get into the house. He finds Joe's dead. He takes out his gun. This is what they think happened. That he took out his gun, tried to shoot Cujo, but Cujo attacked him. Okay. Yeah. Um. So Cujo's got like three people on his body count at this point he, three he's, people he's, yeah this rabbit dog has killed two people and a, and a cop and all at this point yeah exactly Fucking exactly it. so <coughs> donna could hear all this Excuse going on and she knew that cujo he was distracted at this stage and uh, she took the opportunity then at that stage to go to the house to try and get some water for tad i think the, the aim was to go to the house to get water to bring it back yeah because he was so bad but then Cujo clicks that she's after getting out of the car again. And she, he comes running at her. But she managed to get a baseball bat. And it broke a broken half. Okay. But then she stabs Cujo through the chest with her. Oh, mm-hmm. fuck. Yeah, so she was able to go to the house then. Oh, but before that, this is how they know that the, that, that the, that the cop must have tried to shoot Cujo. She managed to get her hands on the cop's gun that she said was lying in the middle of the ground. Okay. Yeah, and she managed to make her way over to the house. But she brought Tad with her this time. Obviously, I would have done the same. Dog's fucking yeah, dead. Yeah. Dog's fucking dead. Like, And she brings uh, Tad in. She said she was drunk, giving him water. And he was starting to come around because he'd stopped breathing for him. in the meantime. He was starting to come around. And next thing, Cujo came running back in. Fucking Yeah, hell. into the house. Night uh, of the living fucking dead dog. <laughs> yeah. But luckily, she had the gun on her this time. Okay. So just blew the dog away. And before you all feel bad about the dog, it, it had rabies. It, it was, was going, going to, to die, die one anyway. way or the other. And it was a murderer. <laughs> it killed three, three people already. Can you call it a murderer? Huh? If, if a human had rabies and it went around killing people. Yeah, probably get get off on a yeah, technicality there. Yeah, you'd well, you're dying in a, about five days anyway. But oh yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But yeah, you, you if you manage to survive it, you'd definitely be diminished responsibility. Oh, yeah. one hundred percent. Saying that, if you if you check out my mini monsters this week, there was a bunch of weevils that were brought to court over some shit. So I mean, you never know. It depends on what country and what <laughs> generation you're born into. To be honest with you. <laughs> yeah i've also done a piece on some donkeys that did three days hard time so. <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> that's mini monsters every thursday and friday <laughs> sounds like fun this week it's usually very deadly serious that's what i'm so. saying it sounds like <laughs> i mean that is the most serious There's show me getting i do to talk every week about things like souls being in demons anuses and, and there you are with dead bodies killers. i'm just doing the fucking the the, the, the morning fucking <laughs> what, what are they there was a uh, death announcement the funeral obituaries or, obituaries that, that's literally what feels like so doing. irish historical obituaries with fucking dr smoke and steam <laughs> i start to worry if like <laughs> radio is, carries uh, on at seven o'clock in the morning you're sitting down listening the only thing is the obituaries are all from the one person's fucking body of work. <laughs> and they didn't necessarily happen in the last few days. No, that's what I'm saying. They're historical obituaries. Yeah. <laughs> that's Cujo. That, that's <laughs> one fucking crazy dog. But I still... Is it weird that I still want to get a St. Bernard and call a Cujo? No like more than ever. Bar- I don't want to call a Cujo. I have made my mind up that when I get my, uh, my little British bulldog, he's going to be called Chewbacca. Chewy for short. Yeah, I like. That. I think it suits the Saint Bernard better. Nah, uh, that's got to be Cujo. Mm-mm. Cujo. 
I also thought Cujo. Yeah. Yeah. It's a cool fucking name. I think it would suit an outstation more. Do you think? Yeah. I don't know. After, uh, after hearing about it, it's the same bar. It just has that look about it. That or Beethoven. But Beethoven's been overused the fuck with that, with that, those names. Oh, uh, yeah. Beethoven. With those dogs, I mean. Same Imagine purpose. having to get angry with your Beethoven standing. Bad Beethoven. Beethoven. Bad Beethoven. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong symphony. He's a musician, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I got Who, the dog? <laughs> yeah. He's got some classics, isn't he? He was, was he deaf or he was deaf, wasn't he? He was deaf. He, he went deaf. He did or was start that off Mozart? deaf. No, no, that was that was uh oh uh Mozart was a bit like Vince McMahon, apparently. But, but um, on people. Yeah. <laughs> and uh Beethoven For more was on deaf. That fucking check out the weekend update <laughs> <laughs> this week. We're gonna talk Vince McMahon, kiss my ass love. No um, Pooping on his innings and turns. <laughs> oh my god, I can't. Don't even get me started on that guy now because uh, we, we will be recording for the rest of the fucking night. Yeah, it is shit fucking mind boggling. Yeah, I still. I was like, did I dream Josh told me that? Oh, and, I mean, this is someone I've watched. My, this is this is what it must have felt like for the people of the sixties with Jimmy Savile. To be honest with you, it's just like this is someone you have watched on TV for years who's played a bit of a sleazy character but gotten away with it for but years but he is a fucking sleazy and character in real out, life he, he just played himself than you've ever imagined <laughs> oh god then we'll have fun with that tomorrow when we talk about it no. Anyway, what you got next on uh, the list? The next one I have on the list is about um, a bear that I had a really good night Oh, yeah. I think everybody's heard of this one. This one did drones on the media big time. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, but I know his name, too. I know his name. You People call him the cocaine bear, but he is. Go on, you can say it. You're dying to say it. Pablo Escobar. Oh, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you. Yeah, you. You like the podcast? Want some more? Then head on over to our Patreon page where for just five euro a month you get up to 12 extra shows in that month along with piles of mini swords covering fun facts from the world of horror and true crime. Each week we drop multiple shows such as Real Monsters where we look at the inspiration behind the movie killers or Behind the Mask where we take a look at the influential people and happenings in the world of Hollywood. All this, plus movie reviews, watch-alongs, and regular AMAs. That means ask me anything. You really do get a bang for your buck. And, and by bang, I mean, like, podcast. I'm not soliciting or anything. Shit. Uh, moving on. For just five euro a month, all this could be yours. So head on over to www.patreon.com forward slash IAA pod. That's www.patreon.com forward slash IAA pod and start listening now. Okay, so basically this guy, Andrew Thornton, he was flying home a load of cocaine in his plane and his plane was too heavy. So he threw all the cocaine off overboard and himself because the plane was starting to go down. Uh, so while he was on the way out, he knocked his head off uh, off the door of the plane. Ooh. Yeah, coming out. So obviously there was nobody there to open his parachute and he fell onto the ground and killed himself. Oh, I've, I've actually watched a bit of a documentary about this and mm. I heard the guy give all about it as well. He was, oh, yeah. uh, he said he, he, he looked out the window in the morning, saw someone lying in his back garden and called the cops and basically said, if you don't get this trespasser off my yard, I'm going to go out there and shoot him. That's Tennessee for you. <laughs> yeah. The guy was already dead. Fuck me. Yeah, right. he was not happy. So anyway, when this guy called the guards, uh, Detective Bob, that's all I could find about him. Bob. Detective Bob. Shit. You think you find more about him? Bob shit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so he came and he was kind of leading the investigation and he concluded uh, that looking at the, you know, the body and the connections that this cocaine must have come from this uh, kingpin drug lord guy, as Sid White, and that there had to be more. So they've been after this guy. This they, guy was a bit of a Pablo Escobar himself. Exactly, okay. exactly. So meanwhile, in the Chattahoochee, Oconee National Forest, uh, there was this big black American bear that had become highly aggressive and started attacking two hikers. I think they prefer the term African American bear now. <laughs> <laughs> They're fucking 
Stop it because I'm going to lose my train of thought and it's going to be a shit show. Okay, go on. So Elsa and Olaf. No way. Yeah. No way. Yeah. Elsa and Olaf. <laughs> Are killed by no one of them is killed by the bear and Elsa and that kind of it. <laughs> and Olaf and Olaf went running off. I'm going to hand over the laptop to you in a second. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> and so that was the start of the bear's spree because the bear had found the rest of the cocaine that awesome. Bob was looking for. Yeah. So the bear was in party mode. The pair was, yeah, the pair, the bear was absolutely <laughs> in party mode. The, the, the bear was going pear shaped. <laughs> <laughs> so, Giving his socks in the middle of the fucking woods. <laughs> Doing that whole big, big box, little box dance and all that shit. Yeah, so while the bear was raving, <laughs> there was two kids that had went, uh, Joe, they were ditching school for the day. Uh, so that was Liz and... To go take coke with the bear. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't Liz. It was Dee Dee and a little guy called Henry. 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 So they're in the forest anyway, and Dee Dee gets chased off by the bear. And Henry <sighs> loses his shit, and he's like running around trying to find a way out of the forest, basically. But Dee Dee's school, in the meantime, had called her mom and oh, let her know that there was busted. no sign of the kids at school. So she decided to go and look, because she, she knew that they were going had basically had an idea of where they were going fr- from what she was talking to. They were known for going to the woods. They, they like to play in that woods, essentially. Yeah, like kind of. So like, that's it. If you're going to go look for the kids, this is where to go look from. Yeah, so exactly. So the mother, she went off looking for the kids and she met Liz, the park ranger, and Peter, who was a wildlife activist. And he was coming in to like, inspect the park and make sure everything was safe for the wildlife. And blah, blah, blah. Okay. Yeah. Like uh the, the, the health and safety oh. kind of guy but for animals I suppose what was uh, Yogi Bear's oh park ranger name again well Liz was the park ranger okay who's Liz I just mentioned was the park ranger oh yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Liz is the park ranger and then uh, and then Peter he was a wildlife activist okay yeah so they were going out to, to do the trails because, like I said, Peter was basically like health and safety nearly for the animals. Okay. You know, like, yeah, an inspector. So they said that they'd bring Dee Dee's mom with them so that they can go look for the kids. So it's like a national park. Oh, yeah. Like, like one of these big, big, these stuff. big, big places. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they're out anyway. They're, they're walking up to these waterfalls that they, <coughs> they suspect that the kids must have gone to. And they come across Henry. Freak out. Okay. That Dee Dee had been chased off by this massive bear. Fuck me. Yeah. So they're calming him down and like Joe, Dee Dee's mom said Peter wasn't believing, the wildlife activist wasn't believing him at first that he was, he was kind of like, well, bears don't do that and bears don't do this. And, and, and you know. What is the rules of that again? Is it, it, different if it's brown, species, I think. Lay down. It, lay down. If it's black, fight back. Is that how it goes? I think they just need a cuddle. Because I know you're supposed to stand up tall against one against and one curl of them. up in a ball. Or like they suggest that you, like they, that you have a big backpack on you so that like when you uh, curl up in a ball on the ground and the bear comes over it, it'll be clawing at your backpack. Yeah, you know? yeah, exactly. They, they, they said like regardless, it will fucking you will get injured when they come over. They will claw at you and stuff. Mm-hmm. You just have to stay rolled up in that ball and not play dead. Yeah, so that's yeah, it. Exactly, exactly. And then the other type, you just have to make yourself as big as possible and. Show a lot of balls. Yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, when they found Henry, the bear decides to attack again. And that was sent Henry up a tree. Peter, the wildlife activist, also went up a tree and Dee Dee's mom hid behind a tree. Which it just sounds terrible. like the uh, the legendary bear in, in Red Dead Redemption 2, to be honest with you. Yeah. They had war with that bear. So did Liv- Liz. Yeah. yeah, the park ranger. So yeah, yeah, there there is there is a bit of a shootout with the bear that didn't really amount to much with the bear getting hurt. Well, I was going to gonna say that in Red Dead Redemption, you can be fucking rattling that bear with bullets and it'll keep running at you. And I always wondered, and I think we talked about it because we talked a bit more deeply about this story on Behind the Ma- on Real Monsters this week. Yeah. And I'm behind the matter. And he, this story kind of managed to make its way onto all three of our shows in one way or another. And we uh, we were talking about uh, 
I was asking you about like what damage would a bullet do because a bear is so thick. Do you know mm. how, how how like far will the bullet get in? Will it get to? Will it hit a vital arm? Will it hit the right? You know, will it put him down? How big does the bullet have to be? Like you know? Yeah. I don't think a regular handgun is going to put a gun. Or is going to put a fucking bear down unless you get a square I would between assume, the eyes. Yeah, if you were like point blank you, uh, in the yeah, head. Yeah. But I think in a body shot, I would say the bear would have a good chance of surviving for a, a while. He'd be, he'd be able to, he'd have enough time to fucking kill you. I think you better off with a tranquilizer gun. If the tranquilizer worked really fast, yes. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'd want to have a shot and it, it, it just like falls at my feet. <laughs> Do <you know laughs> I, 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 it doesn't, I, I don't need it to take effect I wonder time. how fast though the tranquilizer would work on a coked up bear. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or will it give it a heart attack? Fucking upper and downer. Jesus. That's yeah. dodgy. Uh, oh, yeah. So they reckon that the bear, anyway, he was addicted to cocaine at this stage because when he decided to attack Henry and the gang, Peter, the wildlife activist, he obviously went running. He ran through some of this coke that had been uh, dropped out of the plane that, 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 the, that the bear got its hands on. So when himself and Henry were up opposite trees, the bear went straight for Peter. Because he was covered in the coal. Because so he had been, yeah. I don't think he was. I don't think it was like absolutely covered from head to toe. I think he he obviously you know got a bit on him, brushed it off. But bears obviously being bears, obviously they have a really again, good sense of smell. I pointed yeah. this out on Real Monsters as well yeah. about the sharks who oh, became yeah. addicted to they cocaine became and became frenzied mm. in the water, and it was proven by portraying bales that the police threw bales that looked identical to bales that the smugglers had been dumping into the water mm. when they when they thought they were about to be bo- boarded by the Coast Guard, and uh, the sharks just came up and ripped the shit out of it, ate it right up, thinking it was it was coke, and they, and they had like a, an increase in attacks in that area because of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I mean, obviously these animals do like it, but. I can't imagine that amount of cocaine is good for a bear. No, no, no. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely not. So there was a couple of other more attacks after that. Liz had gone back to the cabin to send for help. Uh, the bear followed her back. She was killed. Uh, a few other youths on site, they, but they were kind of... Not vagrant, but they, they were kind of mischievous. Dodgy. Dodgy youths, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to ask you that. How many people are fucking around here at this point? Because this is, uh, we were talking about busy park, but at the yeah. moment you you've listed Liz, this activist guy. Mm. There's these two kids, the mm. kids' mom. Mm-hmm. The cops are inside. There's a, what, at least two cops walking around the place. Look, is it one or two cops walking around the place looking for uh, two clues I on drugs? Think, yeah. Then and this crazy had, bear, and there's a few of these fucking drug addicts fucking pissing about yeah, the place. And then Sid, the guy that owns the coke, that Detective Bob reckoned, um, Sid White, he yeah. sent his son and one of his goons. friends, goons, in <laughs> to have a to have a look for this coke as well. In Basically, the salvage what was there, what they could. Exactly, exactly. So uh, Liz. But as we said, she's dead. The the youths are dead. Uh, the paramedics that she called to come and save everybody, the bear got to them as well. <laughs> the bear got to them as well. Okay. How the did bear this got bear to them, just... but they uh, but they actually got away in the ambulance with with uh, Liz still alive, and it was basically he caused he must have caused the the ambulance to crash because Liz fell out and her face got basically. Taken oh, he off chased the, the fucking thing she, down. He right? chased the ambulance down, and she He's fell out of the ambulance, still attached to the gurney. Her face just gone from the road ah. yeah uh, and then the other two were mauled by the bear uh, why is the bear so hungry i mean like i i understand i know that w- when you smoke cannabis you get hungry but i haven't i heard like traditionally haven't you heard like like models and stuff taking a load of coke so that they don't eat and they stay skinny <laughs> isn't that like kind of a would it make you if yeah but okay if a bear's favorite thing to do though is to eat do you think if you were taking a lot of coke and your favorite thing to do in the whole wide world was, I don't know, like paint, do you think you'd be like painting nonstop? But if you're a bear and like, if you're not sleeping and you're not like reproducing, your next favorite thing to do is eat. So I'm just going to go mad and eat. Maybe. Or hunt. Or hunt. Or hunt. And this took place. And this um, it was say, fall. He's actually fucking eating the whole thing, yeah. just ripping them up more than anything. But the thing is, he would be hungry because he's coming into hibernation season. This happened like uh, kind of fall, that kind of way. Oh, right, right. Yeah. 
So, so he's, just, he's collecting up meat for the fucking winter. Could be. I mean, I'm just thinking here, but I mean, it could be. You wouldn't know. Through a couple of lines, he's like, you know what would be a great idea? Let's just, just stock up for the winter. Let's do this. No, 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 no. <laughs> exactly. So uh, in the meantime, the, uh, Detective Bob found some of this cocaine mm. and uh, there was a bit of a standoff in the forest with Detective Bob and Sid's henchman and son. Okay. Um, then obviously the bear... Sniffed them out. Sniffed them out and came in, um, kind of swinging. Would they? Have, would, would a bear have like uh, a sense of smell that good that like it could be in another area of the woods, but be able to smell that coke is there in that area? And oh, I'd say so. Come that way, like I would think so. I would assume so. Yeah, I suppose if they're hunting hunters, like yeah. Mm. Okay, so these guys now are in a standoff with each other. In good guys versus bad other. guys, but they got this bear to deal with at the same time who also wants it. So it's a, the Mexican standoff between a bear, a cop, and a fucking pair of gangsters for a one ba- one big bag of coke. Exactly. Exactly. And they were lucky they had that bag of coke because ba- Bob used that bag of coke to distract the bear. Okay. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But then Sid shot him. So at least not Sid a bear. Shot- yeah. Oh, Sid was there too. Yeah. Well, like his son wasn't the most reliable gangster and he still hadn't gotten his coke back yet so in case of having to follow up like okay make sure get that his hands dirty. <laughs> yeah, yeah follow the investment make sure he, he yeah, gets his money back exactly like. and like obviously he'd have had pressure from the man above him as well, well like. see, that's the thing like mm-hmm. i mean just because there was a fuck up with the delivery doesn't mean he isn't still gonna have to cool. pay that bill so it's a it's what i assume is millions Oh, I think it was a bit, um, valued about 15 million. Yeah? Yeah, 15 million. Mm. And that's in the 80s? That's in the 80s. This is so. 1985. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, in the meantime, Dee Dee's mom and Henry came across Olaf. His girlfriend also had been killed. And then he said that he had actually, he reckoned that he knew where Dee Dee was. And he went to take him and they came across this cave. And sure enough, Dee Dee was inside the cave. And the bear came and killed Olaf. Holy shit. Yeah. So Olaf went with uh, Olaf. Uh, he left He left the cave, basically. He was going walking, but he didn't get too far. Maybe like two or three steps outside the cave. And then the bear got him. But he's gone with Elsa. He's gone with Elsa. So they're reunited again. Let it go. <laughs> <laughs> so then Sid, Eddie and David. I never actually said his name before now. That was the henchman. Oh, okay. mm-hmm. he, they find the cave and that it kind of it led to a ledge that came out behind the waterfalls where the kids were going and then again the bear came back into the cave and so Dee Dee's mom holy Henry, shit I just realised something because I got confused sorry to, to interrupt yeah, you no 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 you're fine but because uh, you brought up um, what's his name popping up and I, I didn't Sid. Sid popping up I forgot you mentioned that he shot fucking Bob yeah so is Bob oh, dead Bob. Shit, he is. Shit. <laughs> okay, back to the cave. Okay, so uh, they jumped it out into the, the three of them jumped out into the waterfall and they were followed by Eddie and David, who apparently they had chosen to quit the drug business, according to the to, to, to Dee Dee's mom afterwards. To be fair, if I would probably uh, quit the drug business. If a day of your job is you being ch- is you following a fucking drug addled bear to find the rest of your stash, I'm thinking there's easier ways to make money. <laughs> well, to be honest, if I was Sid's son after what happened to Sid, I'd have been like, yeah, I'm leaving this behind. Why, what happened to Sid? Because Sid, obviously, feeling the pressure from up above, decided not to leave the cocaine and he shot the bear. When the bear returned. And it did wound the bear, but it didn't kill the bear. And Sid ended up getting disemboweled and fed to the cubs for dinner. Oh, the cubs. It was the cubs. Mm-hmm. Was, oh, it was Mama Bear. Mama Bear. Yeah. So Mama Bear was a coke head. Mama Bear just needed to let her hair down at night was all. Did the cubs get any of the coke? Oh, I bet you they'd be cute cubs like in Brave if they got their hands on the coke. <laughs> Extremely <laughs> mischievous. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. That's, That's it. the story, That's of, the the story of the tree jumped out of the ledge from behind and got it, got into the waterfall safe and sound and they made off and I suppose they're all distracted and feeding with Sid and feeding on Sid. And Sid got all the blame for this, I assume. His son and, and uh, David kind of seemed, did they do any time for this or did they? 
I have not from what I can or see. Or pseudo, is David a pseudo name? Is this, is this guy kind of hidden? Maybe? I would think that they are. Yeah, because I mean, like even Detective Bob, I can't find much on Detective Bob. And Bob's a very generic Maybe name. they were trying to keep the whole fucking cocaine fucking... I mean, if I was the US government, I wouldn't want uh, people to know that one of my national parks had a fucking drug addled bear in it. I also wouldn't want drug addicts to know that one of my national parks is riddled with cocaine. So, come <laughs> on, everybody. Oh, I could still be there. Well, 1985, it's probably oh, washed yeah. away. Uh-huh. It's Wouldn't be much good. <laughs> They'd want to check what the uh, what the offspring of the animals were like since 1985. <laughs> oh, Christ. Cocaine bear. And now I get to listen to you. Oh, well, we were talking about cocaine sharks. Mm-hmm. So uh, this shark, I don't think it was on cocaine. And I don't think it, I think it's a damn good thing it wasn't on cocaine. Because uh, we'll be getting into a guy that got nicknamed Jaws next. Okay, it's honesty time. We have a confession to make. We suck at socials. No good at Insta. Can't send a tweet or an X or whatever that super villain looking motherfucker is calling it now. Stick to your space cars, Elon. But we know you want to chat. You want to be kept updated. You want to be alive alive all the goddamn time. So we're getting down from the anti-social soapbox and giving this a try. So come chat to us on Insta and Twitter at Alive Alive Pod or hit us up by email at it's alive alive pod at gmail.com. We want to hear from you. Tell us what you like, what you don't like. This is a project. It's still a work in progress and we just want to give you more of what you like and less of what you can't stand. So give us a like, give us a follow. We'll always hit you back and we'll always try to reply to everyone. So come say hi. We don't bite. Well... At least Amy doesn't. And she keeps me well fed, so you got nothing to worry about. Now, back to the show! <laughs> so during an evening party on a New England coast, Chrissy Watkins and Tom Cassidy decided to sneak away and go for a skinny dip in the ocean. Tom, quite drunk, passed out on the sand before he could even undress. But Chrissy, un- undeterred, strips down and dived right into the surf. When Tom woke, Chrissy was nowhere to be found. And she wouldn't be seen again, at least not in one piece. Yuck. You see, in the summer of 1975, the idyllic beach town of Amity was terrorized by a creature unlike any they had ever seen. A great white shark estimated to be over 25 feet long and weighing in at a whopping 3,000 pounds. The beast, which locals nicknamed Jaws, had developed a taste for human flesh and was about to leave a trail of blood and fear in its wake. Do you know what I found out this week that surprised me? Mm. Am- what Amity meant. Friendship. Yeah. yeah. So it was basically because I'm finding it very hard to get through the story without saying Amityville. <laughs> <laughs> but now that I know Amityville means Friendsville, it makes it a whole lot scarier. <laughs> Welcome to Friendsville. Friendsville. You can stay here with us forever and ever. Could you Friendsville on Facebook at one stage? <clears throat> Wasn't that a thing? Friendsville. I have no idea. I never played any of those stupid Facebook games. Why well, you used to play the vampire one. Huh? I know everybody got into the farm one. For, was it not Farmville? Farmville. I did in college. I used to wait for my grapes uh, and my potatoes so I could harvest Riley them. Riley was getting shitty about that. And he was like, I, I, he was inside <laughs> playing a game on his phone. I was like, what's that game? It looks pretty cool. And he was telling me about the game. He was like, the only problem is you only get to play like one level every six fucking hours. Or well, he didn't say fucking. Every you better six not hours, have Every six seven. hours. He was like, it's all right. Levels are long, but uh, it's such a wait. <laughs> You're not paying for your shit. No. So, Amity, a seaside town, was preparing for the upcoming Independence Day weekend, their most financially lucrative time of the year. The community depended on tourism as a major source of economic support, and they waited eagerly for each summer to arrive with, when herds of mainlanders came to savor Amityville show, Amityville's, Amity's <gasps> shores. Fucking hell. Amity's chief of police, Martin Brody, received a call at home regarding Chrissy Watkins' disappearance. Following the report made by Tom Cassidy that she was last seen off the coast, Brody, along with his deputy Jeff Hendricks, began their search on the beach. It was Hendricks who first stumbled upon the segmented remains of Chrissy washed up on the shore and that were, and being feasted upon by crabs. That freaks me out. Crabs eating people. 
Or the fire, the shark eating her, or that nothing, but the crab be eating what was left no, over. No, <laughs> but you, yeah, but I mean, like, <laughs> can, is that not like a really awful thing in your head of like decaying flesh and this these well, crabs all over? One it, right? of the reasons I want to be fucking cremated is because I don't like the idea of being in a box eaten by insects. So. Oh, I was about to say, there's no crabs getting you where you're going if you're buried. No, but there's maggots and worms. And I like the idea of being planted as a tree. Oh, I think that's cool. I idea. think that's cool. My only thing is, though, what if, like, your whole nervous system and all that, and then, like, comes to cutting that tree down? Yeah, I don't know. I like our current idea, where we, where we both get cremated and mixed in together. Because we were doing the, we are talking about doing that sand thing, or the we sand get thing married. when we get married. Yeah. And to have our ashes mixed in together and to become one in death. Unless it's <laughs> like that Doctor Who. Well, what's the Doctor Who thing? Where, like, they get cremated, but, like, how you go is, like, how you are in the next life. So, the people that are getting cremated are literally, like, screaming all through the next life. It was we'll the one with that, with that, the mistress. Ha <laughs> <laughs> ha. <laughs> we'll scream together. Aww. And you forget my name's the doctor now, so maybe I'll sort it out. <laughs> <laughs> Back at the police station, a call from the coroner confirmed that Chrissy Watkins was the victim of a shark attack. Fearing for the safety of Amity's many swimmers, Brody immediately set out to close the beaches until further investigations could be conducted. His intentions are, were quickly noticed by Mayor Larry Vaughan, who, fearing for the income loss that would result from closing the beach at such a pivotal point in the summer, attempted to convince Brody that a shark attack is too hasty of a conclusion. He persuaded him and the coroner to change Chrissy's official cause of death to mutilation by boat propeller. Despite this setback, Brody remained dedicated to the safety of Amity's citizens and tourists, regardless of the financial toll the town might endure. However, Mayor Vaughan held superiority over Brody and forbade him from taking any further action in the case. Over the next few days, ferry loads of tourists arrived on Amity's docks. The beaches were crowded with Brody constantly present as he was obviously extremely concerned about more potential attacks. As Brody and his wife Ellen sat in the sand, a young boy named Alex Kint- Kintner asked his mother for permission to go swimming. Though Mrs. Kintner noted that her son's fingers were starting to prune from the time he had already spent in the water that day, she allowed him 10 more minutes. I was that kid when I was younger. I would fucking loved being in the water. We spent our whole summers in a caravan yeah. park right next to the beach. So, like, we went swimming, like, three times a day. We'd go swimming. Like, we'd get up in the morning, we'd go swimming. Mm-hmm. We'd hang out for a while. Then we'd have lunch, we'd go swimming. Then we'd hang out for a while. Then we'd go swimming before dinner, and then we'd have dinner, and then that was it. But yeah. we'd go swimming three times a day, and we'd be in there until we were fucking prunes, like. Fun. Alex and his yellow raft entered the ocean one last time before set, before being set upon by what was unmistakably an enormous shark. Amid the ensuing panic of the other beachgoers, Mrs. Kittner, who had not seen the attack, called out desperately for her son as the bloodied and shredded remains of his raft washed up in the shore. With dozens of witnesses to Alex Kittner's gruesome death, the presence of a shark in Amity's waters was undeniable and Brody is, was finally permitted to close the beaches. Alex's grieving mother even offered a $3,000 reward to anyone who could catch the shark that killed her son. And a town meeting was held to discuss the official shark problem. There, Brody announced that the police department would be expanding its efforts to keep the beaches safe, as well as bringing in a shark expert from the Ocean, hang on, Oceanographic Institute to assist them. Most of the assembled townspeople were more concerned with the finances than the safety, to be honest, and remained angry about the beaches being closed, although Mayor Vaughan assured them it would only be for 24 hours. Priorities, like... But this is it. Do you know what it feels like? It feels like um, Summer Isle all over again. Mm. The, the, you know, the, the, you have this small island that depends on this very specific time of year to be successful for yeah. the rest of the year. Yeah. Do you know, it's very old school. It's very like, you know, when we're watching Vikings and stuff like that, where it's like you have to, or even when I'm listening to stuff about medieval Ireland on, on podcasts, like mm. on the Irish history podcast, mm-hmm. and it's like, you need to have a good fucking summer. I mean, 
the Irish potato famine. Oh yeah, <laughs> if you shit do, goes yeah. wrong, shit, you're, like I think it was mentioned in the like by one of the witnesses from this time, mm-hmm. and it was like you know if we had a bad summer, it's welfare for the rest of the fucking year. Like yeah, you know? yeah. Um. So yeah. So they, there was a bit of a panic. And when, um, even with the, the idea of just it being 24 hours, the crowd took off again, like something out of South Park, you know, the whole rabba, 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 mm-hmm. rabba, 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 But that chatter was quelled by a weather-battered man by the name of Sam Quint, an eccentric and rough-looking ship, a fisherman who guaranteed the capture and slaughter of the offending shark for the price of $10,000. Though his offer was not accepted at at that point, Quint seemed confident that the job would fall to him eventually. With Mrs. Kittner's reward made public, scores of amateur shark hunters crowded Amity's docks, coming from all over the Northeast. Two local men made a clumsy attempt to lure the shark with a pork roast, which resulted in one of them nearly becoming the shark's third victim. Arriving at the same time as the horde of overconfident fishermen was Matt Hooper, a shark expert from the Oceanographic Institute hired by the Amity Police. After meeting with Brody, Hooper was allowed to view the remains of Chrissy Watkins, which were brought to him in an ominously small plastic box. Hooper, visibly shaken after examining the mangled body parts, assured Brody that Chrissy did not die in a boating accident, but was in fact attacked by a shark. Not long after that, the bounty went out for Jaws. Well, Jaws. I was going to say it went out for his head, but I suppose like the jawbone is kind of the trophy to keep in this situation, isn't it? I've so. never seen, oh, yeah, I've more commonly seen shark's jaws than the shark. <laughs> You, you don't see a skull, so is that all that is there of your skull? Do they have more skull? I am going to check this out because that's a good question. Because yeah. I've only ever seen their jaws, you know, up on display. I would have assumed in my head that their skeleton was just a very, very, very big version of like the sardine skeletons that you'd see in Tom and Jerry and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could kind of. Yeah. No, but I mean, like, they have, like, whale skeletons in natural history museums, so surely... Yeah. Uh, oh, no, they have a skull. I Do think... They? Yeah, they have to. Yeah, it's it's like their jaws are here, but then, like, their 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 nose snout thing kind of comes out and, like, um, like, like, nearly a knife blade, but, like, not connected. So you could take the, this part off, but just have the jaws. There. Crazy. Okay. But usually the trophy was the jaws. Yeah. And jaws is jaws is what they were looking to get here. The town thought they could breathe a sigh of relief when the corpse of a large tiger shark was displayed on the docks, having been caught by some of the contending fishermen. Brody was initially elated, believing the nightmare to be over, until Hooper examined the creature's mouth and determined that the bite radius did not match the wounds on Chrissy Watkins' remains and therefore was likely not the shark they were seeking. Hooper, wanting to be certain, suggested that he examine the contents of the shark's stomach as its slow digestive system would ensure that recent meals would still be inside. Brody supported the plan, but Mayor Vaughan seemed disturbed by the notion and disapproved. He was kind of afraid that uh, the sight of, you know, if they <laughs> if they were to cut that shark open and they had the right shark, mm. the sight of uh, a dismembered child's body falling out of oh, its yeah. guts would uh, yeah. put the tourists off just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, when news got out of the shark's, the shark's capture, Mrs. Kittner arrived to face her son's killer. Clad in black and choking back tears, she approached Brody and slapped him across the face, furiously accusing him of keeping the beaches open despite having prior knowledge that there was a man eating shark in the water. I lost my shit. Well, it wasn't Brody's fault, was it? Well, no, but I mean, it was misdirected, but I lost my fucking shit at someone. Brody later said this incident made him both angry and ashamed and made him determined to prevent further attacks. I suppose he was ashamed in the sense of that he didn't stand up harder Good against the mayor like, and yeah. say, fuck off, we yeah. are closing this place, you can stick it up your ass. Yeah. <laughs> uh, privately, Brody and Hooper discussed the shark situation, underlying their earlier suspicion that the captured tiger shark was not the animal responsible for the deaths of Alex Kittner and Chrissy Watkins. Hooper believed that the culprit was not a tiger shark, but a great white shark. And unless it could be stopped, it would be likely remain in Amity's waters until its food source ran out. So in other words, until the people had the common sense to stay out of the waters in Amity. Exactly. So Hooper and Brody decided to examine the shark's stomach contents themselves, regardless of Mayor Vaughan's opinion. 
The men visited the deserted docks that night and located the dead tiger shark. Hooper sliced his body open only to find some bisected fish, several tin cans and a Louisiana license plate, leading him to theorize the sharks made the shark made it up it made its way up the Atlantic coast from the Gulf of Mexico, finding no human remains. Hooper and Brody confirmed that this could not be the shark they were after. So do sharks just fucking eat anything? I was just about to ask how come the license plate didn't kill him? <laughs> I thought you would at least got like a perforated and bow or something from that. <laughs> uh, Hooper convinced Brody to continue their investigation out on the water, though Brody was terrified of the ocean. And that probably wasn't made better by the 3,000 pound man eating sharks swimming around there, like. No, no. <laughs> uh, using sonar equipment, Hooper located a large object a good distance away from the shoreline. Brody recognized it as, a, as the boat of Ben Gardner, a local fisherman. Hooper went to investigate the half submerged craft and threw on his scuba gear before entering the water. It was on this dive that Hooper discovered a large hole in the hull of the boat and claims to have found an enormous tooth embedded on the side. Hooper says that while examining the tooth, he was suddenly horrified to find the corpse of Ben Gardner floating out of the hull. And out of shock, he says he dropped the tooth and his flashlight while rushing back to the surface. Brody and Hooper made yet another attempt to reason with the mayor, hoping their latest of discoveries would make, you know, a bit of a difference. Mm. But Vaughn, however, still stubbornly dismissed their arguments, insisting that even with the evidence of Ben Gardner's ravaged boat, there is no proof that a shark was responsible. Hooper explained that he had pulled the tooth of a great white shark out of the hull of Gardner's boat, but Vaughn merely rebuffed him once again since Hooper could not produce the tooth he had dropped in the water. Though he allows Brody and Hooper to take extra precautions to keep the beaches safe, he refuses to close them. Now, Independence Day weekend finally arrives, bringing plenty of tourists. But the beach scores were, to say the least, uneasy about Mm. the amount of police boats patrolling the water looking for the shark. Vaughn was concerned and Owen was swimming, so a personal friend of his has come forward and said, like, he came up to him and he was like, yeah, buddy, you need to get the fuck in that water, start encouraging people, yeah. you know, like, yeah. hey, if you go in, if they see you go in, then other people will follow. So he convinced this man to take his, his himself and his wife and his grandchildren into the water okay. to put everyone else's mind at ease, which worked and people did fucking following right. so remaining on the beach brody was aiding with the shark patrol his eldest son michael wished to take his new sailboat out into the water with his friends but brody asked him to take it to the adjacent uh, estuary estuary is that how do you pronounce yeah, that estuary. just to be safe what's an estuary what's the difference why why is it safer there why would an estuary be safer uh is it just shallower water yeah, it's the tidal mouth of a of of a river where the tide meets the stream. So I would assume that the Beyond river like doesn't this. want to go upstream. Okay, just yeah. uh, so Michael reluctantly agrees. <coughs> excuse me. And in the meantime, a dorsal fin appeared among the swimmers <laughs> in the main water, and panic erupted. The crowd scrambled back into the beach, and the police boats closed in, only to discover that the shack was merely a cardboard fin wielded by two young pranksters in snorkel gear. <laughs> Could you help yourself, really? Though? Someone had to do it. I would like to know how they made it out of cardboard and the cardboard didn't crumple in the yeah. sea. Yeah, how'd you sure get that far into the water though. before, you know, yeah. anyone noticed it? Because it would have to go underwater to get it there, wouldn't it? It would, or else you're just a kid with a fin on its back. <laughs> you'd be noticed on your way out <laughs> shh don't tell them <laughs> <laughs> the beach goers began to relax but a young woman overlooking the water sees the unmistakable form of a huge shark making its way to the estuary where Michael and his friends were sailing the woman's cries at first were dismissed as another prank but when Ellen reminds her husband that their son is in the pond Brody goes to investigate Michael and his friends are approached by a man in a rowboat who is instructing them on knotting techniques when boat vessels are suddenly capsized by the shark known now as Jaws. After the startled sailors surfaced and made their way back to their turned over boats to safety, a terrified Michael watched in paralyzed horror as the older sailor man failed to reach his rowboat in time, resulting in him being ripped apart by the giant shark. Michael and his friends were thankfully brought safely back to shore, though Michael did have to be taken to hospital to be treated for shock. 
Brody confronted Vaughn once again and put his foot down, demanding that real action needed to be taken to take deal with the shark. Vaughn, realizing that his own children were on the beach that day as well, finally relents and gives Brody full permission to close the beaches and do all that is necessary to stop the shark. Sam Quint, the hardy old fisherman with the 10 grand prize tag, was immediately hired. Though Quint was a vastly experienced shark hunter and wanted to take on the mission alone, Brody insisted that he and Hooper go along as well. There is instant tension between Quint and Hooper, with Quint seeing Hooper as a rich snob with no real shark hunting experience, and Hooper seeing Quint as a reckless trill seeker with a bullish attitude. Though Hooper proves himself to be a capable sailor, the discomfort remains as the three men embark on their voyage in Quint's boat, the Orca. I wonder if you named that with the orca is the killer whale, isn't it? The orca is the killer whale, yeah. And they are killer whales because they kill sharks. Yeah. All right, so I guess that's why he named his boat there, because we will learn why he dislikes sharks very soon, but this is obviously why he had named his boat the orca. The orca. Once out at sea, the men set about attracting the shark by ladling chum off the stern of the boat. So what was the plan? Uh, Harpoon, once it got closer, just throw a fishing rod in and hope for the best. Fishing rod? Yeah. (laughs) Quint attached a line of piano wire to a sturdy rod secured against a specially designed fishing chair on the deck. After hours of waiting, the wire got tight and eventually snapped as the immense creature swam under the boat before disappearing again. It was at this point Brody, Hooper, and Quint realized the enormous strength of their aquatic adversary. Mm. As the voyage pressed on with no further sign of the shark, Brody grumpily ladled more chum off the back of the boat when, without warning, the massive head of a great white shark emerged briefly from the depths below. Hooper noticed the shark beginning to circle the boat and Quint rushed out for a look. He estimated that the shark was 25 feet long and weighed 3 tons at least. After backing orders to Brody and Hooper, Quint began to fire harpoons tied to plastic barrels intended to both slow the shark down and make its presence more visible. So like when the shark was around because the barrels were harpooned to it, you would see the fucking barrels floating along the oh, water. Yeah. there. Though Quint hit the shark with three harpoons, the barrels had no effect and the shark easily pulled them underwater and out of sight. Luckily enough, though, in the midst of all the ruckus, Hooper managed to attach a tracking device to the beast before it retreated again. That night, the men had dinner and drinks below deck, surprisingly beginning to bond as they compared scars from their experience with various sea creatures. Brody noticed that Quint had had a tattoo removed, and Quint told him that the former tattoo represented the U.S. Navy cruiser Indianapolis, on which he had been a sailor in World War II. Quint went on to illustrate the horrible day in July of 1945 when the Indianapolis was sunk by Japanese torpedoes, leaving over 1,100 men floundering in shark-infested waters. Quint witnessed 800 of his comrades being picked off by sharks. The experience combined with survivor's guilt had ignited Quint's deep-seated hatred of sharks and the rootless satisfaction he finds in hunting them. Brody said later that the men began to sing a rowdy sea chanty to lighten the mood, but were interrupted by the returning shark violently crashing into the boat and causing a leak. Quint rushed to the deck and fired a rifle at the tree at the tree telltale barrels, but the shark escaped once again. Smart shark. Yeah, fucking hell. Imagine this shark and shark NATO would we be in like major trouble? Would Not if we had doing. Quint apart. Huh? Is that what our mouse is? Is our mouse like the jaws of mice? <laughs> it's a smart little fucker, but the only thing is it's making itself fat. And the last time I saw it, like, going in under the utility room door, it was wiggling and it's little butt. struggling. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, he's going to trap himself in here at some stage. The next day, the men attempted to repair the boat with limited success. Seawater had contaminated the diesel fuel and the black smoke billowing from the exhaust pipe confirmed that to the men. They had taken on some serious engine damage here. But they had no time to worry about that as Jaws made his way in to finish the trio off while they were at their weakest or in their hour of need. 
Quint instructed Hooper to grab the barrels with a hook and secure them to the stern. Hooper completed the task successfully, allowing Quint to attempt to drag the shark by powering the boat to full throttle, but the shark used its own incredible strength to pull the boat in the opposite direction, nearly capsizing it and causing further structural damage before Quint could cut the boat free of the wire that binded them. According to Hooper, the shark broke free from the barrels and submerged again. Now, at this point, Brody wanted to call him for more help. Okay. And uh, this will kind of show you the type of person Quint was. Quint freaked the fuck out, picked up a baseball bat, freaked the fuck out, and started smashing the CB radio while Brody was trying to call for help. He, it was like he was determined that he was going to be the one to be bringing the shit. This sounds like some Moby Dick kind of shit. Mm-hmm. This guy was like, this is my fucking whale. I'm taking it in, like, you know? Uh, he had a grudge. Yeah, he, he was getting the, 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 this great mm-hmm. wife, you know? Yeah. Despite the hard feelings on board, the Orca, the trio, had to put their feelings aside to deal with the problem at hand. Jaws was closing in. Dismissing Hooper's protests that he is over to overtaxing the already damaged engine, Quint put the foot down or arm forward. I don't know how to drive a boat. Do they have that? You, you, you push the lever forward to go faster, isn't it? I don't think you use your feet. Yeah, I don't think you use so either. Okay. <laughs> either way, the engine inevitably failed, leaving the boat to slowly sink in the vast haunting, hunting ground of the bloodthirsty shark. Quint, strangely cla- calm, offered life jackets to the other men, though he took none for himself. He sounds like uh, Randy Quaid's character in Independence Day. He has the same grudge with the shark as Randy did with the aliens. And by yeah. the sounds of it, he planned to take Jaws out the exact same way Randy got the aliens. I love that. Dead or alive, he'll get a man shark <laughs> bounty. <laughs> oh, fucking man shark bounty. I don't know. He, he's, he's just going to go get him. What, what was it he said as he flew into the fucking uh, spaceship again? You be a motherfucker? No. Is <laughs> it? Hey boys, I'm home or something like that. It was something oh, epic. yeah. I know yeah. Randy Quaid's a fucking, he's a bit of a lunatic apparently. Oh, I just forgot which. Yeah, no, I remember. He's a bit crazy. He's uh, Jack Quaid. Jack Quaid. Jack Quaid is the is Scream, right? I thought that was Dennis Quaid's son. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, he's that's what I was gonna say. He's he's his nephew. Oh, are they brothers? Randy yeah. Quaid, Dennis Quaid. Didn't know that. You I didn't know that. I Randy and Dennis Quaid just, are brothers. Yeah, yeah. No, I thought it was just a coincidence. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't yeah. know many Quaids. Jack Quaid is his nephew. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you knew that. No, nope. well, I knew Jack Quaid was. Dennis Quaid. It's son. son, yeah, but yeah, Dennis and Randy Quaid are brothers. Let me have a look at him. It's this, uh, this. Why, why, why did why did I never get this? Because they're very different. <laughs> anyway, uh, well, she's looking shocked now. She can't believe it. Fucking, uh, fucking National Lampoon. Fucking Randy Quaid. Yeah, no, yeah. No, did, did you not know that? Did you? No, I know that's Randy Quaid. I just still can't get over that he's Dennis Quaid's brother. Yeah, doesn't matter. Anyway, running out of options, Hooper resorts to putting on his scuba gear once again and having Quint and Brody lower him into the water inside a shark-proof cage. His aim being to inject the shark with poison using a harpoon syringe. Would you go down in one of these shark cages? I couldn't go down in a small shark cage. Um... I want to have an old rattle at the cage before I get in, like, see how strong it is. <laughs> if I can't bend it, the shark definitely can't. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <That'd> <laughs> that fine. wasn't the case here. Quint pointed out that even the needle on the harpoon gun was too small to pierce the shark's hide, but Hooper believed he could inject it into the beast's mouth. The cage proved to be no match for the shark, whose attack who attacks Hooper with such ferocity that he drops the harpoon and is forced to hide in a reef while his cage is destroyed. But why do they keep sending Butterfingers Hooper down there? Like, he dropped the shark to his torch, and now he's after dropping the harpoon gun. I don't send the guy to start as easily down to deal with the giant shark at all. <laughs> Brody and Quint hauled up the remains of the shark cage and could only assume that Hooper was dead. That's true. Like, would the water not be running red? Like, uh, not be a clear indication? 
I don't know, maybe he pulled him down deep enough before ripping him up. I don't know. I mean, does it get diluted enough quickly that you wouldn't see it maybe? I mean, all the hubbub of everything that's going on. I don't know. I've I mean, never seen a real sinking. shark attack. You yeah. barely have time to react before the shark leapt from the water like a breaching whale and landed most of its body into the sinking stern of the boat, nearly breaking the vessel in two. Quint and Bro- Brody desperately clung to the cabin as the boat was upended, upended, with the shark's gaping mouth at the bottom of the drop. So basically, imagine the boat is going up like the Titanic was, you know, up on its side, yeah. like there at the top, holding on, and at the bottom is the shark's mouth open wide, waiting to fucking eat him. <laughs> Quint ultimately lost his grip and despite Brody's best efforts to pull him to safety, slid into the mouth of the shark and was gruesomely shredded and devoured right in front of the petrified Brody. The shark with Quint's bloodied corpse in its mouth slid back into the water. Horrified and believing himself to be the only survivor of this seemingly doomed mission, Brody hastily entered the cabin of the rapidly sinking boat and grabbed one of Hooper's pressurized air tanks that he used for oxygen while diving. The shark smashed through the side of the boat again, its enormous mouth perilously close to Brody, who attempted to fend it off by bludgeoning it with the tank. The shark retreated with the air tank now lodged in its jaws. With little more than the boat's mast remaining above water, Brody climbed to, the, to its summit with a rifle in hand. Now possessing some of Quint's courage and madness, Brody fired at the approaching shark, aiming at the air tank in its mouth. At last, Brody hit its mark. The tank blew to pieces, taking the shark's head with it, leaving Brody celebrate, or celebrating triumphantly as blood and shark flesh ran down around him into the sea. What? Well, that's not me swimming in the sea this summer. Uh, Paddle and Poodle's going to do the job for me i think <laughs> oh yeah we'll fill it with ice and beer like homer simpson clothing optional yeah but we have no fedging or fedging hedging <laughs> <laughs> or fencing so the neighbors they're not going to be happy with that what are they going to complain about you're gorgeous you're grand yeah but like that's double standards like, i'm naked in the back garden and it's gossip but if you're in the na- naked in the back garden you're a sex offender so you can keep your mankini on you heard it here first from Amy Rose. No <laughs> togs, no entry to the private pool on the Smoking Steen Estate this summer. Mainly because it's in no way private paddling pool in the middle of a housing estate. Ah, it's Ireland. By the time you realize it's hot enough to go swimming, it's raining again. And we're back inside listening to us. <laughs> and there's always plenty to listen to. It's Say What Weekend Update, Creepypasta Crypt, Mini Monsters, Patreon exclusives, Behind the Mask and Real Monsters. And of course, this show right here, it's a live live coming out every Wednesday, every Wednesday most of the time. <laughs> Until then, don't forget to like and su- subscribe to us on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, Audible, Google Pods, Acast or wherever you listen to your podcasts also you can follow us in all socials at alive alive or follow my personal pages at amy rose iaa for some great content pictures and podcast updates see the script says pretty pictures but she keeps dodging that one it's like i don't want to say pretty pictures i don't want to say pretty pictures. <laughs> they're pictures they're pictures they're not pictures they're photos they're photos sexy pictures Wow. <laughs> it's a live alive podcast, all the guts and go, none of the guilt. See you all next week. Same alive alive time, same Harvest channel. Love you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>